Hi everyone and welcome back to the Athlete Climate Academy. Uh, we've got a special one for you today with a friend of mine who uh, we've been working a lot together on climate activism and training people, especially athletes, to talk about climate in the outdoors. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Dan Yates. Brilliant, thanks for having me on, Hugh. No, my pleasure. It's uh, it's really nice to have you on the Athlete Climate Academy because we've, we've talked so much about what is uh, athlete activism and we run trainings together and the likes but you've got a you work for, for protect our winters in europe now but you've got a, a a long and storied past not long and storied i mean it's just it's the sufficient amount but you've done a lot in the in your short life dan um so yeah. <laughs> where 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 does your background come from and how do you get to where you are today um well technically uh I, I suppose when you when you when you tell people what you do uh i'd always describe myself as a as a whitewater kayaker that's that's the where i what i grew up doing um as a kid uh i i lived in cornwall so we used to do whitewater kayaking on dartmoor but then it it really got i really got involved when i went to university in cardiff and started paddling in the south wales valleys and the black mountains and then finished university uh, got a job as an optometrist, um, mostly because I worked out that that was the job where I could work the least number of days and go <laughs> kayaking the maximum amount I could. I don't think I've ever worked more than three days a week until until I've until I've got my current job. Um, and then yeah, moved to North Wales uh, and got really heavily involved in the kayaking scene and have been lucky enough to travel all over the world kayaking got some good first ascents got some cool missions under my belt um in you know pretty much every continent really so so yeah that's that's my background as a, as a whitewater kayaker really a kayaking in the the south wales valleys doesn't automatically bring you on to uh some of the biggest descents in the world we've got some some lovely descents around around here but uh how did you was it a, a getting into the world of whitewater kayaking from an athlete point of view what was that journey like was it you know you started to get really good so you started looking at big rivers or was it just i would like to go and paddle these rivers in wonderful places yeah i mean i, I never set out with the mission to become sponsored or professional or anything like that and to be honest when i was when i was involved and still now like i've probably picked the hardest sport to actually make any sort of living out of at all so i never really tried uh but basically my, my whitewater kayaking was I, I i wanted to be able to get enough equipment to be able to keep myself in kayaking equipment and i wanted to get the opportunities to travel and paddle as much as possible and just get to paddle with some of the best people in the world get to meet up with people abroad and them to go ah oh, like dan can come kayaking with us we've sort of we've heard of him or something you know that's all i wanted out of it uh i have never sort of sought to to make it uh something that really paid or anything like that uh i've been lucky to be a brand ambassador for a number of different brands and 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 things like that but that was never my aim uh, my aim was to go to as many places as possible and paddle as many different places different sort of white water as possible uh when I was in my 20s, I was really excited by paddling steeper hard white water in Norway or big, huge volume white water in Africa, places like that. That was what I was really into. And as I got a little bit more into the sport, I, I definitely became more and more interested in multi-day missions, the more exploratory side, the going to the Himalayas or, you know, South America and paddling multi-day runs that are in slightly more remote places was what became more interesting to me probably so i got into my 30s and stuff so that was that's my sort of journey through kayaking i suppose and you know that yeah. that story is not is one that a lot, lot of athletes will empathize with with i just want to go and do what i do do what i love and that means you know i'm 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 not capable of doing that here because we don't have the big rivers that I want or the big mountains that I want or whatever else. So you end up traveling all around the world, uh, getting lots of different stories, um, but also putting a lot of time on, on planes and, you know, getting to these places where you bring those stories back with you, but there's a, a toll on you as an athlete and on the planet as well. Yeah, I think I think I traveled a lot. I mean, kayaking is pretty good in the fact that when you – it does tend to be not necessarily for me it wasn't necessarily a large number of trips but I, I definitely try to focus on the less trips stay for longer 
option, you know, when possible. So if I went to Africa, I'd try and go for like eight weeks or three months or something like that. Um, but yeah, I did ended up end up traveling probably more than is good for the planet. I think I was doing this 20 years ago when maybe that wasn't thought about quite so much. Um, you know, your own sort of per- personal footprint side of things. I think I, I led a fairly frugal life outside of my flights to go kayaking but that's still no excuse you know and uh i think a lot of athletes have had that same conundrum where they're traveling more than they want to and they're traveling to uh super wild and beautiful places but then you've then got that dichotomy that that almost by being there you're changing those places slightly even though you're trying to stand really lightly you're trying to leave as little you know as little footprint as possible uh and you know leave no trace behind even by visiting these places interacting with the cultures there you are leaving them a little bit different from when you arrived so so i think that is the sort of the sort of dichotomy that everybody that does that kind of exploratory expedition-y type sport probably wrestles with a little bit so and i suppose the optimist in in everyone would say that they also left you a little bit different as well, that they changed you uh, as well as you changing the places you go to. So what was it that that changed the way you thought about that? Because I definitely as well, you know, growing up, I mean, is it, it was a different time back then, but you didn't think about climate change in the way that, that we do now. Um, again, no excuse, maybe just an explanation, but the, the, the change from you know, in your twenties athlete that didn't think about that as much to someone now who thinks about it probably on a daily basis. When did that happen? I think, I think my, I mean, my route into activism, I work on climate now, but, uh, my original sort of activism, which I started, I suppose really heavily as a, as a career, I suppose, 10, 12 years ago, something like that was always in protection of wild places. So keeping the wild places that we love looking the way they look at the moment and and that was for me by protecting rivers from physical disruption of those uh, namely in the form of developments on the banks canalization of the rivers or obviously the big one was was building dams uh, in those rivers and i was finding that i was sort of traveling around the world and getting this this list of rivers that i'd gone and paddled which were then either disappearing like the white nile um I was really lucky to, to be out on the White Nile in, in the sort of uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, when it was a stunningly unspoiled place. You know, you paddle past uh, islands in the river filled with fruit bats and, you know, monkeys and everything. It's an unbelievable place. People just living on the banks of the river. And that whole river now has been almost completely destroyed with two huge dams built on it since since I first went there. So I was getting this wow. list of rivers that were, were sort of disappearing bit by bit. Um, and then I found myself almost like booking trips to rivers that I knew were going to disappear. So so the, the big one for me was we, uh, myself and a, a few group of, uh, a couple of friends uh, planned a trip to, to China. There's a, there's a river called the Yellow River, which all the big rivers in Asia all flow from the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, and then they flow off into India or, you know, Thailand or stay within China. And the five, five biggest rivers in, in Asia all do that. And five biggest rivers in the world, really. Uh, and this one river, the Yellow River, flowed from the Tibetan Plateau and cut this sort of huge canyon uh, about 100 kilometers long uh, as it goes down sort of off the Tibetan Plateau and drops down to the sort of Chinese flatlands. And we'd heard from a friend of ours that lives out there that there was a dam being built at the at the base of this canyon. And this canyon had, had never been successfully paddled before. Uh, it, so it's still waiting the first ascent. Uh, a team of people had tried it before, but they didn't get the, the first ascent tick because... Um, there's these rules where you, where you have to follow to get an official first ascent. And if every member of your team drowns on the way down, then you, you fail. Uh, so they didn't get the first ascent. So off we went um, on our holidays, you know, packed our bags, no idea, had some like ancient Russian maps that we were going to we were going to follow uh, to do this sort of river. Didn't have permits, didn't have permission from the Chinese authorities. We just flew there, kind of winged it, had the most amazing time got this this sort of fantastic first descent of this river done it took us about four days or something like that and then and then actually tried again to run a second river that flowed you know, a contributory of this river uh and that's when it all went wrong you know we had like 
these horrendous rainstorms. There was huge landslides into the river. We, we basically got trapped in this section of canyon where we, we, we couldn't progress downstream any further. So it involved leaving our kayaks behind, climbing for two days up this huge cliff face to try and find our way out of this canyon onto the Tibetan plateau where we were then, you know, miles from anywhere uh, and managed to eventually get rescued by these people that were there, you know, these Tibetan caterpillar fungus farmers that were there collecting this 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 fungus they collect on the hillsides. They were there for just two weeks doing that and we bumped into them and they walked us for a day to a farm and then this farmer, you know, told us that there was a mail truck coming and we got a lift on the mail truck the next day to a town. We didn't know where the town was, but there was a bus there and we could get a bus from that town to this next place. And anyway, it was this complete disaster of a trip, you know. Everything went wrong. It's the closest I've ever come to dying, but we just about survived. But then but then the river didn't this huge force of nature that was there that you know almost ended four of us and seemed you know completely unstoppable a few years later was completely flooded in a reservoir by a huge dam built by the the chinese authorities and it, and it just really brought home to me that even though these places when you're in them look wild and look you know that are the most powerful forces on nature I've ever seen, you know, incredibly impressive looking, are so fragile, you know, they can be just snuffed out by by the whim of a political party or a, an energy, you know, an energy company or something like that. So it really shook me up that one, that, that the world was changing really fast uh, and it was changed, you know, and I, I was not happy any longer being a, a passive absor- observer to it, and I felt like I needed to act. We came home from that trip, and then almost immediately afterwards, the river in North Wales, where I live, the Fairy Glen, uh, which is one of the best sections of whitewater kayaking in the UK, it's the reason I live here, it's the reason all my friends live in this town, was then slated for hydropower development by the multinational power company RWE and the landowner, the National Trust. Uh, and that was it. You know, that was I couldn't I couldn't see what had happened to the White Nile or the Yellow River in China happen to a river that's a five minute walk from my house. Uh, so, you know, a bunch of us banded together as, you know, sort of dirtbag kayakers and formed a, a little campaign group that we called Save the Conway. Uh, and we've we fought for three years against the planning authority, the environmental regulator, Wales's largest landowner, and a multinational power company. Uh, and we won. You know, we stopped that. We kept that river looking the way it did now, and, and the way it did ten thousand years ago, and it still looks the same to this day. And uh, and it made me realise that as someone who's passionate about wild places or an athlete or a local resident that you can actually make a difference and it was time to step up a little bit so save the conway which was this campaign group became save our rivers uh we've campaigned on i don't know eight or nine different hydropower projects in the national park in snowdonia in austria we've supported campaigns in the balkans um We've supported activists in Norway. We've campaigned against changes to national park legislation, changes to planning legislation. And that, that's that been my my last sort of 10 years. I've been focused on, on that protection of rivers, protection of wild places. And then just last August, I moved on to working on, on climate because obviously that's the big existential threat to, to everything, really. So I felt that um, I still work on protection of wild places and i still work with save our rivers and a couple of other ngos to do with rivers but moving into climate has really i mean that's a big one that's like uh that's that's it's way less tangible it's much broader it's much more complex um but it's it's really rewarding work so that's that's how i've got to where i am i suppose so you might think that because it sounds like you're, you're in climate now one of the biggest ways we can get it, um, get ahead in bringing our carbon emissions down is uh, renewable energies. Um, best ones out there, solar, wind. You'd imagine it would be hydropower, but then you're actively campaigning against hydropower in your other job. So you're for, are you for it in the one and against it in the other? Why, no, why is mean, there that 
I mean, this is this. I have to be really careful here. This is me. This is this is this is Dan Yates speaking. This is not at the POW yep. official standpoint. Um, but you know, hydropower is what we would call a false a false climate solution. So, and there there are myriads of reasons for that. First of all, um, and we've talked about this, you know, privately as well. We're seeing huge changes in rainfall patterns across the world. Um, we're seeing uh reduction in snowpack and we're seeing reduction in glacier size so when we're building hydropower schemes um the big ones tend to be built in monsoon areas or areas which are fed by large snowpack or 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 glaciated you know mountain ranges so we're building a renewable energy system in a in a place where we know for a fact the science tells us that resource is running out you know that resource is becoming less reliable in terms of monsoons uh or snowpack is reducing year on year uh most parts of the world where this is being built are becoming drier or and then maybe suffering from acute floods um and glacier size is reducing so we're, we're first of all we're building a system around a resource that we know is running out um and that's you know that that, the science behind that secondly there are huge emission issues with particularly large-scale hydro and that's mostly around two two forms one is the amount of concrete and and structure that needs to be built to to um facilitate the building of a large dam the amount of land that then has to be cleared deforested devegetated to to flood the reservoir Um, and then and then thirdly is the amount of methane that is then produced when you flood a previously vegetated area even if you did devegetate it really carefully there's still vegetation remaining there's sediment coming down that river that contains nutrients and there is nutrients in the soil of previously vegetated places and that off gases a huge amount of methane in fact if you add up all the methane off gassing from the world's hydropower reservoirs it adds up to it's something like the eighth largest cause of climate change so it's it's more than the entire of canada emits in greenhouse gases or more than all of global aviation so it's so it's huge you know this this sort of methane off gassing and if you look at the impact of of the time scale of how that works so when you build a dam you pour all this concrete you cut down all these trees all this vegetated area and then you flood a reservoir and all this methane gas- off gassing occurs the vast majority of that impact occurs in the first 10 to 20 years of the dam's life so we're looking at the construction of a large dam project taking around 10 years and then we're looking at most of the methane off gassing happening in the next 10 years so all that impact is happening in the sort of 20 years from now but it's it's 2022 and we have to hit net zero by 2050 we've got 28 years you know we cannot be going well we'll earn this you know we'll earn this green energy in in 20 years when we finish this impact and and it doesn't matter that we're having an impact now because we don't have time to do that we cannot be having those emissions front loaded because the time that we have to act on climate is now it's halving emissions or cutting emissions by 60 percent by 2030 and it's cutting to net zero by 2050 so we can't be building systems where we're front loading the emissions to the beginning of the of the program so that's the sort of emissions issues with hydropower and then there's the biodiversity impacts as well so our freshwater ecosystems are the most at threat ecosystems on the planet. So more than rainforests, more than coral reefs, you know, more than savanna, more than north standard forests, you know. Um, when we when we look at the impact that hydropower has had on our freshwater systems, and it's predominantly hydropower dams that has done this, we've lost 83% of species size of freshwater species since 1970. You know, that's that's crazy that dwarfs any other impact of any other ecological system so that's in the time that i've been alive within my own lifespan we've lost somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of all freshwater species that's just and you know two-thirds of freshwater species are now threatened with extinction so we're then building these these uh you know this infrastructure in what is already the most threatened habitats on earth um so it, it's not like if you're going to build a solar panel farm you can you can choose where you want to build that you know you can build it 
on people's roofs or you can build it in agricultural land or you can build it on wasteland but you can move it around whereas a dam has to be built in a river and so it's you know you're you're forced to locate the impact in the place where it has the most negative impact possible so so it's yeah it's it's a real problem um and then and then you look at the social impact as well you know in the last century we've displaced something like 30 to 40 million people from hydropower projects you know that that's enormous and when you look at deaths caused by hydropower failures um, and this is ignoring disease or the 140 million people that live downstream of of dams that have had their their way of lives impacted when we just look at how many people are are directly killed by dams failing or you know having their land flooded um the the biggest hydropower disaster ever was in was in china in the 70s and it killed 87,000 people and displaced 1 million people um i mean that's enormous i mean you can look at it dwarfs impacts of things like nuclear accidents or, or anything like that. And in fact, when you look at the deaths per you know megawatt uh, of power produced from every energy system, the lowest is is onshore and offshore wind. Well, the lowest is nuclear, uh, and then the second lowest is offshore onshore wind. The next lowest is solar panels, and then it's hydropower, and then after that it's oil, gas, coal. So it's it's you know in terms of impact on people hydropower is the worst of the low carbon options that we have so uh i think i've covered it that seems like a fairly comprehensive list of uh dams are bad um, well the the reason i love hearing you talk about that and so passionately is because quite often when we talk about um climate solutions and sustainability you you're often driven by your common sense right like the renewables are good fossil fuels are bad and as athletes we're going to be driven by that common sense we should always be uh, aware of the fact that we could be wrong at some point and that's actually okay to have someone say to you that thing that you thought um that's actually not true it's the opposite way around and you know as a as scientists we are prodded to do that all the time so and switching is not flip-flopping on what you previously thought it's just making new conclusions with new facts and new observations so something we always push athletes to do is to to learn new facts and and think what they get and their common sense to begin with but then you know if someone if they get new information new facts then you can adapt that and and use it but you can see why athletes would be reticent to put their opinions online when you know before chatting to you I spent a lot of time in this in this industry, and I don't, I didn't know as much as you've just told me about hydropower. I if someone put a a dam near me, I'd I'd probably been like, yeah, this is this is great. I'll get behind it, until you learn more information. But if an athlete puts something online and they're gonna get trolled for it, especially if it's if it's wrong, it's difficult then to go back on that and say, oh, actually, I've got new information. I'm gonna go back. How would you? How would you, what would, what would you do to, to say to athletes, it's okay to do that? Or here's some tips to, so that you don't get into that trouble in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we, sort of, we, I mean, we've talked a, a lot about this when we've, we've been involved in training athletes before. And I think one of the things that I, I really like um, that you talk about a lot is, is, is how, to, how to Google shit, you know, it's like how, how to look things up and, and making sure that I would always fact check anything that anybody tells me and i'm sure some of the stuff i've just said you'll you'll do it like a sneaky google search on like afterwards just to do a little bit more reading up on and i think it's always good to check that and it's always good to you know make sure you're confident when you're checking things the sources that you're checking as well so a lot of the stuff i've just said you know i wasn't aware of 20 years ago but then that's actually because a lot of that science wasn't available then. All this information around methane off-gassing and the, in, the impact of that is quite recent. It's all discovered within the last 10 years. So sometimes it's not even changing your mind. It's the science has moved as well. And you need to stay up to date on that. So always, you know, have, have a look up of stuff yourself. Do a bit of a read around. It doesn't need to be super thorough. Be careful of 
when you're googling things what's the date of the sources that you're that you're looking at and you're and you're sort of uh you're sort of checking you know where is that source from is it from a respectable sort of scientific journal is it peer reviewed or is it you know a blog of a, a a blog of a a particularly militant you know sort of environmental cause or a blog of you know like the green page of shell sustainability you know shell oil sustainability platform so do you know i'd be a little bit careful of the sources and that's and that's something that that's to be really careful about but also to when you when you do put stuff online and out there I do always try and put stuff with a source, you know, and, and I try and stick to the the facts when we describe these things. It's very easy for me as a kayaking athlete to go, oh, I hate dams, you know, they're terrible, like they impact beautiful places. And then it's quite it's quite easy for then people to come back, you know, oh, you're just worried about it impacting your sport, impacting a beautiful place. You know, think about, you know, but we need them for energy. Whereas if I say methane off gassing produces more uh, global warming than aviation or than Canada and I put a source there that's a fact you know nobody can come back and and troll me for stating that fact and that fact speaks you know volumes you know it nobody can troll me for saying we've lost 83% of freshwater biodiversity you know species size since 1970 because that's a fact it's it's in the IPBE s report you know it's 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 a statement and that that says a huge amount but it says it without me um you know without any hyperbole it says it without me putting my own spin on it and and we call that factivism you know that's using facts to to say what you want to say and if you put that source in there as well then there's very little a troll can do to come back on you and i think that's that's a good way to stop yourself tripping up You've checked it. You found a fact. You found a source. You know it's correct. Uh, and then you know there's there's little that people can do to criticise you for just communicating facts. You know I think that's that's a, a really good way of of avoiding criticism when you when you post online. So yeah, you're never going to get around it altogether. No, no. <laughs> they're always going to be there. They're all, they're always going to going to get at you. But yeah, the factivism I I really enjoy being. Being up to date on things, we we try at the Athlete Climate Academy to to make sure that we have uh, new information coming out and um, people like yourself uh, coming on to talk about this this stuff as well. And I know Protect Our Winters do so much of that, and especially the, in the activism side of it, the carbon literacy training that that Power Run uh, I think is great. I've I've done it myself and um, and it was fantastic. Is there anywhere that our athletes can go to for Protect Our Winters, whether they're they're in Europe, um, like us, or if they're in the States or anywhere else, where can they go to to find out more and keep up to date with these issues? Yes, yeah, so, I mean they can they can check that out. Obviously, um, Protecto Winters is is active all across Europe. So I work for Protecto Winters Europe, but we have nine national chapters. So we've got the UK and we've got the Nordics. So we've got Norway, Sweden and Finland. And then we've got the German speaking countries. So we've got Austria, Switzerland, Germany, and then we've got France and Italy. So we've got nine national chapters, uh, all of which and, and athletes kind of the athletes that we work with are our power ambassadors, which are our our superpower really you know working with athletes is 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 incredible i mean i think when we look at um how we communicate with our audience we speak to around you know protector winters chapters in europe speaks to around a hundred thousand people daily on social media whereas our athletes reach around three million people uh through their social media channels so so our athletes are key to us getting our messages across so you can contact your national power chapter that if you live in one of those countries or you can get in touch with protector winters europe we're online on instagram on facebook and protector winters europe is there as a central port of call for anybody that wants to get in touch with protector winters in europe we coordinate the european chapters to make sure they've got the resources they need to be a, a single place where brands can approach protector winters to talk about you know the work they want to do in advocacy and we can direct people to their national chapter from there 
Um, we run various training programs through Potential Winters. The, the sort of base level that we do with our athletes is called the Power Hour. We do that about once a month or once every two months, where it's an hour online webinar where any of our athletes or any other athlete that's just interested, you don't have to be signed up as a Power Ambassador, you can just be interested. Um, we can send you the invite to that. Uh, you can you can tune in and it will be an hour talk by a climate scientist or an athlete activist or it'll be on our latest campaign and, and it'll give you information there we also run um the the power of knowledge sessions which are from external guest speakers whether they're the last one's just been from business leaders uh the one before was from um was from a sort of glaciologist and and so we have those sort of science-based scientific workshops as well and then there's the more deep dive intensive training that that you and i have been involved in you where where we've been going and and delivering sort of in-person workshops to athletes to help them be more effective at communicating and uh, give them the tools they need to become effective climate advocates really so so yeah there's a there's a lot of different ways in so and building a, a community in the athlete space for where it's safe to talk about um, climate and and use those voices in a way to to talk about it with their followers and um, with people who you know having good quality interactions with people uh, on this whether that's you know weekly or uh, on social media or whether that's in person at events um, that community that the power started to to build is really important and a and a wonderful place to uh, to finish as well we'll put links to uh, all that kind of stuff down the down the bottom um, but Dan, thanks so much for coming on and talking about your journey into uh, into Save Our Rivers and in POW and, and good, honest factivism. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Hugh. Thanks for having me on. And uh, as I say, any athletes that want to get involved, uh, we'd love to expand our network, reach out to more athletes and, and give you the tools to be, like I say, effective climate advocates, really. Absolutely. Good morning.